Good morning, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library. Very excited to bring you this program on talking trash. Not exactly what you think. It's about trash and recycling. <laughs> so um, I hope you're really invested in that topic and um, ready to learn all about ways to minimize our footprint. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to our uh, Cary Library Foundation, which supports all of our adult programming. Um, we could not do these kind of programs without them. So we're going to get started right off with uh, Neil Ryan, who is the president, no, I'm sorry, the founder and executive director of Keep Mass Beautiful. And he's going to tell you, you a little bit more about himself and then go right into his presentation. So welcome, Neil. Thank you, Mina. Thanks for having me. Uh, and welcome, everyone. So um, this morning, um, we're going to be talking trash, as Mina mentioned. Um, and again, my name is Neil Ryan. I'm the founder and executive director of Keep Massachusetts Beautiful. And I also uh, want to let uh, just mention that this program is supported by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. So we thank them for their support. Um, and you know, we're going to talk today about what happens when you toss something in the trash or the recycling. You know, where does it go? What happens from there? Um, we're going to talk about ways we could all reduce, reuse, recycle more effectively in order to clean up our state and our planet, which is currently drowning in plastic waste. Um, and before uh, we get started, just a couple of logistical things. Um, Mina is going to put something in the chat box, if, if you're familiar with how to use the chat box, uh, a link to a survey. So at the end of this presentation, if you have a, few, a couple of minutes, uh, please just take the survey and give us feedback. We're trying, always trying to improve this presentation as we, uh, as we go along. And also, if you have questions, uh, I'm going to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes. There's a lot of information here. Um, and then uh, if you have questions that pop into your head as I'm talking, just put them in the chat. And then at the end, we'll open it up and we'll, just, we'll try to answer all of those questions. Um, I should also mention that this is being recorded, so that means you're being recorded, so just so that you are uh, fully aware of that. So um, that's Neil, uh, Yes. I just wanted to say that um, in the recording, people will not show up so they can keep their videos on if they would like since you're spotlighted. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to jump right into this and I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me a second. See, this is what always happens to me now when I do this. Always works perfect in, in the uh, practice. Slideshow, just tell me if you're seeing slideshow from the beginning. Yeah. There it is, right? Okay. All right, great. All right, so. Uh, first, I'm going to talk kind of at a global level, then we'll bring it down to the state level, and then we'll talk, you know, more specifically about uh, Lexington, what's going on there. So this picture here is really an example of what's wrong with our consumer packaging. Um, you know, why do we feel compelled to, to wrap something that, ha that already has its own natural wrapper in, in styrofoam and, and plastic wrap? Um, and, and you see examples like this, you know, everywhere. So if you go to the supermarket, you know, all the produce milk, water, everything is packaged in plastic. Uh, and when you won't go to take your purchases home in many places in Massachusetts, they wanna put it in a plastic bag just to add insult to injury. Um, and it, it, you know, whether you buy a pack of chewing gum or a, a birthday card at CVS, um, you know, they wanna put it in a bag. And it's just, um, we just we're just drowning in, in all this waste. Um, and as you can see, you know, we end up with, with scenes like this here. And like most people, you know, you probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about trash um, and, and what happens after you uh, throw it away. But, you know, the issue we have is that uh, with plastic pollution is that, you know, we live on planet Earth, which is basically, you know, a closed system. So whatever trash we generate here on Earth stays here on Earth. And, you know, worldwide, uh, we've got scenes like this where disposable plastic packaging is, is just overwhelming uh, our planet. And every minute of every day, we've got essentially a garbage trucks worth of, of trash, plastic trash entering our oceans in different places all around the world. 
And scientists estimate that by the year 2050, we'll have more plastic in the oceans than fish when, when measured by weight. And, and some people, including um, our, you know, some of our current uh, government leaders in the EPA actually like to point fingers at other countries, particularly those in Southeast Asia, uh, saying that you know, they are primarily uh, responsible for, for this problem. And, and while there is some truth to that, you know, a, a recent study, a study came out in 2016 that found that while the US is just 4% of the world's population, we produce 17% uh, of the world's plastic waste. So we certainly have a role to play in, in trying to solve this problem. And must, much of this uh, plastic and trash, as I mentioned, is ending up in our oceans. Um, and in the form, you know, it starts out as litter on land, but it eventually ends in our oceans. So um, to that end, I'm gonna actually launch a poll question here. Uh, let me just see if this works. Um, so the first question there, if you could take a minute, um, it asks you, what is this, what do you think is the single most littered item on planet Earth? So we've got uh, five choices there. Um, if you know how to use the polling and if it's working properly, put in your vote. Uh, are you all seeing that? Because I'm not seeing any votes coming in. I see it, but I don't see any votes coming in either. So I think maybe... it's because you have five, four or five questions. So it's taking us a little longer to go through all of them. Uh, just oh, just question one. Question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, I thought, that, yeah, they should have been separate questions. I think it's a problem because you you have to, I think you have to complete all of them before you get this. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? Let's just skip over that because that's going to take too long. Uh, so, uh, but I see, uh, I'll give you the answers as we go. How's that? So for the single most littered item on planet earth, the answer is, is cigarette butts because uh, unfortunately people who smoke just don't tend to, to understand that that little butt is actually a piece of litter. Um, so, so I'm going to end the polling on that and just continue uh, with, the, with the presentation. That's Sorry, okay. That yeah, now. yeah. No, no worries. Um, so, so you know, you know, the impact of all this, uh, as you, you know, we we see it on wildlife. Uh, this, you know, we are seeing whales and, and other marine animals around the world uh, washing up dead on on beaches. And when they do the autopsies, they often find their stomachs are just full of plastic waste. Uh, this was uh, off the coast of. Uh, Thailand, there were 80 plastic bags in this whale's stomach. Um, out on uh, Midway Island, you know, thousands of miles away from, from any humans, the birds, are, the seabirds are dying because their stomachs are full of plastic. They see, a, you know, a blast plastic bottle cap, they mistake it for food, they eat it, makes them feel full, and then they eventually starve to death. This is actually an albatross. Um, so, um, and you may have seen this viral video of this poor turtle that had the straw stuck in its nostril. And then if you like to eat fish, like many of us do here in New England, right? Uh, we're probably all eating plastic. Um, when they do um, examinations of fish, they're finding you know, that the fish are eating these microplastics and uh, we are in turn are eating the fish, so we are eating plastic. So this is a major problem. And um, you may have been heard, I, I imagine many of you have heard of this Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, and that's just, that's called a, a gyre, which is basically like a circular currents that, that, that form uh, in the ocean and concentrate trash into a, a particular area. And these gyres, these are huge sections of, of the ocean, like, you know, bigger than the state of Texas. Uh, but some people envision it as like, you know, like an island of trash that you might be able to walk, you know, walk across it, but it's really more like a, a minestrone soup of, of mostly microplastics. So, you know, something, a water bottle or something like that, that, that gets into the ocean, eventually breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics. And uh, that's what the fish are ingesting. And then we're eating the fish. 
Uh, so, and so each of the, our oceans has a garbage patch, has a gyre and a garbage patch. It's not just the Pacific Ocean. So looking ahead, you know, this chart shows, it projects worldwide uh, production of plastic. So as you can see, this was done a few years back, I believe 2015, but you know, the trend is not our friend in this case. Um, you know, today the world produces about 300 million tons of plastic each year, and only about 9% of that gets recycled. So, you know, we're not gonna recycle our, our way out of this, this problem. Uh, we can certainly improve our recycling, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but, you know, we, we need to come up with uh, other forms of packaging or reducing the amount of plastic that we're all using. And again, this photo just kind of sums up, you know, this, this idea that there's no place called away. You know, you toss something away, it, it's going somewhere. Um, and unfortunately, um, certain areas of the world, this is what people are contending with. Thankfully, we're not seeing something like this in New England. All right, so now we're gonna kind of bring it down to, to Massachusetts, you know, and what, how do we actually manage our trash here in Massachusetts? So, you know, one of the things we need to understand is how our local actions contribute to these problems or solutions. Um, so what happens to our trash here in Massachusetts? In Massachusetts, around 60% of our municipal solid waste, that's what we all throw away, is incinerated. And that's much higher percentage than most other states. Um, and these facilities are called municipal waste com combustors. And they burn the trash and generate electricity. So it sounds like, you know, an amazing idea. This photo here is actually from the Millberry plant, uh, Millberry Mass. Um, and so while incineration seemed like kind of a a great solution when it first came out in, in here around 40 years ago. Um, there are some trade-offs and there's trade-offs with all of these issues. And here, in, in this case, it's, you know, you've got the air pollution, um, you know, what goes up must come down, as they say. Um, when they do tests of the soil and the water around these facilities, they find higher levels of mercury, uh, which is a known carcinogen and, and other, you know, pollutants. Um, and then also after you're done burning, whatever it is you're incinerating, you, you still have ash, you know, then that needs to go to a, a, a landfill. So it's not like we burn things incinerated and it just magically disappears. You still have this toxic ash after the fact. Um, so for these and other reasons, the state of Massachusetts has banned the construction of new incineration plants. Uh, most of the plants are now 40 plus years old. Um, when they break down, it does cause bottlenecks in the processing because there's very little excess capacity within the system. Um, and it's possible that we'll have, there is some new technology called gasification that's a little more sophisticated. And they're used, I know in some places in Europe, they're using these plants. Um, but the, the challenge you have with all this is that, you know, the NIMBY, the not in my backyard syndrome, right? So if they came to Lexington and said, hey, we're, we're gonna build this new waste energy plant in Lexington, my guess is that a lot of people would be opposed to that, you know, for the reasons I just mentioned uh, as far as pollution. Um, so, so for that reason, you know, we're not seeing, there are currently no new plants being proposed or, or in the works. Um, this just shows you where the incinerators are in Massachusetts. Um, they tend to be located in uh, lower income areas. Um, you know, which is a kind of a, a separate issue of environmental justice. Um, and then, so then the other uh, primary means of, of disposing of our trash is, is landfills. So, you know, what is a landfill? You know, when you look, think about it, it's really not too sophisticated. It's kind of the, been dealing with trash uh, in this way since the days of the cavemen. You know, we essentially dig a hole in the ground, we dump our trash, we put some dirt on top, another layer of trash, dirt, and so on. And what starts as a hole in the ground eventually turns into a, you know, a mountain of trash. And we, at one point, had more than 300 landfills in Massachusetts. You know, a lot of towns had their local you know, dump, so to speak. Um, and, but you know, most of those have been capped. They reached capacity. And now we have these larger facilities, uh, of which we're down to uh, just six uh, in the state. And again, you know, there are trade-offs. So we're not burning it, we're burying it in this case. 
Uh, but you know, the downsides are, you know, well, it's, there's odors and smells, there's truck traffic, uh, the seagulls flying all over the place. Um, and then two of the main environmental downsides are methane gases. So all that rotting trash is emitting methane, which is a, contributes to, to climate change even more than carbon dioxide. So, um, uh, so that's one issue. And then you've got leachate. So we're dumping a bunch of to toxic things into these dumps. And when it rains and snows, a lot of those chemicals get leached out into the soil and the groundwater and can contaminate the groundwater. Now, most land, you know, landfills that are built today have liners and a little more, a lot more sophisticated than they used to be. But um, you know, even in, in Southboro, Mass, there was a, you know, a recent problem where an entire neighborhood's water supply was contaminated um, due to leachate. So um, this, uh, again, this map shows you where the, uh, you know, the landfills are in Massachusetts. It's actually a little outdated because um, we are now down to only six landfills in the entire state in uh, Bourne, Carver, Dartmouth, Middleborough, uh, so we have a concentration down there in Southeast Mass, uh, Westminster, and then Nantucket, believe it or not, has its own landfill. Um, but by 2030, uh, Mass DEP estimates that all of these are, are likely to be closed by 2030. So, you know, where's it going to go? Well, right now, about 20% of our trash goes out of state uh, via rail and truck. Some goes to New Hampshire, um, some goes to Ohio, believe it or not, and as far away as South Carolina. So um, as you might imagine, it's very expensive to ship trash all over the country. Um, and, and because of this limited capacity, you know, the cost of disposing of our trash and recycling is, is skyrocketing. Um, so when contracts come up, uh, I know in Lexington, you have uh, Hart, E.L. Harvey, you know, when that contract expires, I'm not sure when that's going to happen. You know, more than likely, the new price is going to go up significantly. Boston is paying um, $125 a ton uh, for disposal. Uh, they spend $28 million a year on trash and recycling. And these costs, you know, they're covered by all of us. So, you know, the taxpayer, either as a separate fee as part of your property taxes or even component of your rent if you're renting. And you know, just keep in mind, waste disposal and recycling is a very profitable multi-billion dollar global industry. So there's, there's money to be made in, 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 in managing all this. So um, let's just take a look you know, and think about, well, what are we actually tossing away every day? And uh, this, this chart comes from Mass DEP uh, based on what they uh, examined, what's coming into the incinerators. And um, the thing that stands out, obviously, here is that you know twenty six percent is is food waste. So that's you know that's kind of um, the low hanging fruit when in, when you look at the state's efforts to to reduce uh, how much trash we're dealing with. Uh, there's a big focus on on uh, on reducing food waste in the new solid waste master plan that they are currently um, finalizing. It's for you know, targeting in the year 2030. So right now, for example, commercial facilities that generate a thousand or more pounds of organic or organic waste must uh, compost. So these are large, you know, large facilities. Uh, but more than likely, um, that level is going to be cut in half. So so this may impact some schools and uh, other smaller facilities that currently don't have to compound compost will start having to compost. And then there's also a focus on you know, how can we get more just individuals and families you know to start composting, uh, because you know when you think about what you pay for when you pay for disposal, it's it's all it's all based on tonnage, and food waste tends to be a lot heavier than, say you know, uh, an empty water bottle or a, you know a napkin or whatever it might be, so that's a big area of focus um, uh, that the state is 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 uh, looking at. All right, so when we look at the big picture of, you know, what are the best ways to manage it, um, you know, th this slide here just, you know, shows you kind of, you know, least preferred to most preferred. Um, and you've probably all heard of the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, so we're gonna focus first on that third R, recycling. Um, so 
first off, just defining, you know, what is recycling, you know, because for some people it's just, hey, I put something in a blue bin and I'm done. Uh, but what it really means is to, you know, to convert waste into a reusable material. So plastic bottles can be, you know, melted down, shredded and turned back into plastic bottles, or in many cases, actually, plastic bottles are used to make fabric for um, fleece jackets and, and other clothing, which is somewhat surprising, at least I thought it was. Um, you know, plastic bags can actually be turned into decking for uh, Trex decking. Um, you know, aluminum cans are actually one of the most easily recyclable um, items out there. Uh, so that's, you know, in an ideal world, that's, that's how uh, things would work. Um, and this diagram shows you again, in an ideal world, how things would work. So you've got a plastic water bottle, you put it in your bin, it's collected, it's then taken to a material recovery, a recycling facility, otherwise known as a MRF. And that's where they sort all the materials and then they they put them into bales. So if it's plastic water bottles, you know, they create a large bale of just plastic water bottles. So what they hope is just plastic water bottles. Um, that's then shipped to uh, someone who, who buys that material to say, all right, I'm gonna use this to make, uh, you know, either more plastic bottles or fabrics or what have you. Um, so it's then shredded and washed, melted down and processed back into new products. So that's kind of the ideal product life cycle, um, but that, doesn't always work this way, and I'll we'll get into that um, in a minute. So one of the challenges, you know, statewide and, and locally, we have is something called uh, an acronym I, I coined in my own household called MROs, Missed Recycling Opportunities. So if I open up the trash barrel and I, and I see a obviously recyclable item in there, I will point out what, what's this MRO doing here, um, and. So, you know, that's the challenge we face is that some people just don't believe it's important to recycle. Um, you know, if you go across the state, even in public venues, um, you will find, uh, you know, recyclables in the trash and vice versa. So uh, you might be at a, at a concert or a, a Fenway Park or wherever back in the days when we went to Fenway Park and concerts, but someday that soon, hopefully we'll be doing that again. But you know, you'll see a, a recycling bin and right next to a trash bin and at the top of the trash bin, you know, there'll be obviously recyclable items. And there might, there might be clear signage, you know, recycling, water bottles here and, and people still just don't do it. Uh, so that's um, kind of, I guess I call it recycling resistance. That's, that's one challenge we have is just trying to get people to understand why they should recycle in the first place. And then the second uh, even, bigger challenge is, you know, getting them to do it right. Because, you know, as these bales of, of, of recycling materials, you know, indicate it, it's a dirty business. And, and that's largely the result of our adoption of this single stream or, or mixed recycling system we have. Um, so it, when, when recycling first started rolling out here in the US, you had, um, and I know some places still have this, but Everyone had you know, separate bins for glass, paper, plastic, and so on. You had to do the sorting as a consumer. Uh, and then the recycling company said, you know, we're gonna make it easier for people, we'll give them one bin. They don't have to do the sorting. They can throw all the recycling into one bin, which will achieve that goal of getting more people to recycle even more, which is a good thing. But at the same time, it created a, a, a problem on the back end in the fact that many people, um, do what's known as you know wish cycling. So they, they have an item, they think it's recyclable or they'd like it to be recyclable. So they toss it in that recycling bin. And when you do that, you are creating contamination. Um, and contamination is occurs when you know different recyclable materials get mixed into what is supposed to be a single commodity. So you've got, you might have glass, you know, combined with plastic, that, that's not gonna work. Um, you know, if you have a an Amazon bubble wrap, you know, contain uh, envelope that can't be recycled because it's it's two materials. It's that plastic bubble and it's paper. So you know, but a lot of people will throw that in their recycling bin because they again they they wish that it's recyclable. Um, and when you have too much contamination, the plant that processes those materials may reject it 
And when that happens, the entire load of recycling may end up going to a landfill or to an incinerator. Um, and a lot of this came up, you know, this, this focus on contamination really hit about, really became more important about three or four years ago when Ch uh, China instituted the China sword policy. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this or have heard of it, but a few years back, China decided, you know, they no longer wanted to be the dumping ground for the world's recycling and plastic waste. So they reduced their allowable contamination rate to 0.5%. So that means if, you know, if a bale of plastic bottles is shipped to China for processing, it has to be 99.5% plastic bottles. And in the US, the contamination rates are much higher than that. I mean, they're typically well above 10%, some, some communities 25, 30%. So um, as a result, you know, we're no longer re, re, uh, exporting our recycling to China. Uh, for a while, there were some other Southeastern Asian countries that said, oh, we'll pick up the slack. But now even they are all saying, you know what? We don't want this. We don't have the infrastructure here to handle this. So, you know, this phenomenon that we have here of, hey, I did my part, I put it in the bin. Well, if it isn't processed all the way through uh, correctly, you know, we're not really, really solving the problem. Um, so, to address this problem, um, you know, Mass DEP came out with this RecycleSmartMA.org website, which uh, some of you, I, I imagine, are familiar with. And you know, the key to effective recycling education is to try to keep it simple and and not overwhelm people with too many details. You know, especially you know, some of us, if you're tuned into this presentation, you might have a higher interest level than your average citizen. But your average citizen, you know, just wants to just like give me the big, the big picture. Um, so um, this website launched uh, a couple of years back, and you can use this uh, Recycle Smart tool and Recyclopedia tool. If you have a question about something that's recyclable, you can enter the item in the database, and it will give you the answer as to whether you should recycle it or not. And they got together with all of the different uh, uh, recyclers across the state to try to come up with the same answers to, to the same questions because there's a lot of variability often from one community community to the other. So they try to get everyone on the same page to again kind of reduce confusion and get get everyone working on the same page. So you may have probably seen this uh, this graphic. I know it's on the Lexington website. So this is kind of like the high level guide of, of what should be recyclable. Uh, and, and what isn't. So that top row are the things that you wanna focus on. Uh, metal, food, and beverage cans are recyclable. Plastic bottles, uh, bottles, jars, jugs, and tubs are recyclable with the caps. Now I noticed on the Lexington website, they actually, and I, I wasn't able to get an answer. I called, but I, no one called me back. Um, they They actually list like, specific plastic numbers. Um, most communities and the state as a whole they are trying to get away from that. They're just trying to get people to focus on these shapes because sometimes the markets change. So like a number six is currently in demand or recyclable, but I don't know, a year from now, maybe it's not. Um, so rather than making it so confusing for people, if you have those items, put them in your recycling bin. If somehow certain types of plastic are not recyclable, that's up to the processors to, to deal with that. Um, the other things commonly recyclable glass, uh, bottles and jars, um, including the caps, and then also paper and cardboard um, magazines and, and so forth. Um, but the bottom row is what I wanna focus on here. And uh, these are the, the kind of the, top offenders when it comes to contamination. Um, and one of the poll questions was, uh, what do you think is the most uh, biggest problem from a contamination viewpoint in, in this single stream system? And the answer is and was uh, plastic bags. So, you know, these are the biggest troublemakers because they, they get into the machinery that is used to sort all these materials as this picture shows and they gum up the works. So 
no stretchy material of any kind should go in your recycling bin, whether it's a plastic bag or a saran wrap, or sometimes you see people, you buy, they buy a case of bottled water, which I don't, I don't encourage doing that, but if you do do that, um, you know, you get that, it's called over wrap. So that plastic wrap that surrounds the entire case and there's cardboard, you know, liners. So some people will just say, oh, there's cardboard and they throw that with the wrap in their recycling bin. That's not gonna get recycled. And, and that plastic wrap can get stuck uh, in the gears here um, as this, this photo shows. Okay, so, um, this issue of paper versus plastic has been debated, uh, you know, for, for a long time. Um, 139 communities, including Boston and Cambridge, have passed plastic bag ordinances uh, to try to reduce the use of plastic bags. And there was a state, a bill to do it statewide that um, was gaining some momentum, but then they tinkered with it and kind of watered it down a bit. And a lot of the environmental groups in Massachusetts actually opposed that latest version. And then COVID-19 hit and everything kind of ground to a halt. So I don't know where this currently stands at the moment, but um, I would think it's a good chance we'll have some type of statewide standard for plastic bags uh, maybe next year. Um, but, you know, the, the, the real answer on this paper versus plastic is, you know, is neither, you know, reusable bags um, are obviously the most environmentally uh, friendly choice. Uh, there was some issues when COVID uh, hit uh, last spring where the state uh, said, no, you can't bring reusable bags into supermarkets because of the, the danger of, you know, bringing in germs. Um, that has since been rescinded because there really wasn't any science backing that up. It was kind of just um, out of an abundance of caution to use that overused cliche we've heard many times over the last several months. Uh, but that's um, you, most supermarkets, as far as I know, uh, across the state will now let you bring your own bags in. So that, um, that is uh, something we would recommend. Um, other prime, uh, Offenders in the recycling stream are things called tanglers. So hoses, wires, things like that. Um, do not put into your recycling bin because again, it gets caught in that machinery as I showed you a couple slides back. Uh, you wanna clean your, uh, rinse your recyclables to remove food waste and all liquids before putting it in your bin. You don't need to go crazy and you know, run things through the dishwasher or you know, use 20 gallons of water to clean something out. Uh, but you know, give it a quick rinse, and um, and then from there, it's pretty much good to go into your recycling bin. Uh, actually, I should I should mention uh, the often asked question about pizza boxes. So that's one where state has gone back and forth, or you know, are they recyclable? Are they not? The current answer is yes, they are recyclable, provided you know if you look at the box and it's covered in cheese and soaked with grease, then then it's probably better putting that in the trash. Or you can actually, one, one tip is just rip it in half, recycle the top half and throw away the bottom half. But generally speaking, pizza boxes are, are now considered recyclable. Um, other big offender is textiles. And this, uh, so anything made out of fabric, whether it's old clothing, sheets, towels, whatever, um, can go in. I know you have simple recycling in Lexington, I believe. So that's a great program. So you can put everything in there. You don't have to worry about, is this uh, shirt that I'm throwing in the bag, uh, you know, is it ripped or stained? And is anyone ever gonna wear this? If it's not saleable, it will be used to make things like insulation or industrial rags, things of that nature. So that's the big push. Roughly about 6% of the trash in our landfills and incinerators is textiles. So that's an easy kind of a thing we could eliminate if. Uh, you can either you can donate stuff in the there's bin collection bins in many places, or if you, you've got the simple recycling program, just put it on the curbside. Uh, but don't put any types of uh, uh, textiles into your trash or your recycling bin. So um, I mentioned earlier, RecycleSmartMA.org. That is the actual website. Again, you can enter in an item if you're not sure about something. Um, you know the mantra we use is when in doubt find out or throw it out, but don't 
wish cycle. Don't think, don't just say, ah, I think I'm gonna toss it in and hope for the best. Uh, that causes more problems than putting, than causes more problems to put a non-recyclable item into the recycling than, than the opposite of that. Um, and this, this database is updated. So if you put in an item that is, and there is no answer, you can suggest like, hey, um, can, you, can you research this and, and add this to the database? So last I heard, there are more than 400 items you know, in the database. And if sometimes if you don't find what you put in, it might be, a, you know, think of a synonym for what you put in because um, some, you know, might be worded differently than you're thinking of it. All right, uh, moving on to just a, a hard to recycle items. So uh, Beyond the Bin is again, another mass DEP uh, website where you can plug in your zip code. And if you've got things like housewares, electronics, sporting goods, used furniture that you know you don't want to just throw away, um, you, you can find a nearby place that where you can donate that. So again, that um, keeps keeps more items out of the waste stream. And um, you know, if you can donate it, you might save some money by not having to pay for someone to take it away. All right, this next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit since we're heading up on the holidays here, some holiday recycling tips. Um, you know, this this uh, bin here, this is recycling bin, you know, is often uh, unfortunately what many of the bins look like after the holidays. In this particular case, it, I mean, it's overflowing for one. Number two, they're, they're, they're committing mistake number one, which is they've bagged all their recyclables in, plast in plastic, which means it's going straight into the trash. So it's just kind of defeating the entire purpose. But just some kind of uh, general tips for, you know, whether it's uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate, um, as the, as the holidays approach, um, you know, maybe focus more on buying experiences than stuff. Now that's harder to do, obviously, in our current COVID situation, but um, so that may not be as applicable this year, but in the future, uh, hopefully it will soon be more applicable. But, you know, I know I, I always tell my wife and my family, you know, hey, what do you want for your birthday or this? I'm like, you know what? I don't need any more stuff. <laughs> like, Get me tickets to a a Red Sox game or a concert or whatever it might be. So, um, so think along those lines. Um, number two, wrap responsibly. So, you know, and then my, my, I joke, but my sister is a prime offender in this area. She spends more time, more money on the, on the packaging than she does on the actual gifts. Uh, so, you know, if you can tolerate not, you know, going crazy with the sparkly wrapping paper, the, the, the tissue paper, the bows and strings, um, you know, that will be the more environmentally friendly choice. If you do use those items, um, you know, try to reuse them. You know, you can save those, those bags, the bows, the strings, and, you know, reuse them next year, even the cardboard boxes for, for gifts. Um, you wanna keep holiday tanglers out of your recycling. So uh, if you've got uh, lights that are no longer working or tinsel, um, you know, you don't wanna put those in your recycling bin. Um, they, they should go in the trash or some places do collect old string lights. Um, I think you can check on beyond the bin. Uh, I believe I've heard, you know, different things that whether like Home Depot and Lowe's and places like that. I think some of them do and some of them don't. So check in your local area, but um, don't as number one, don't, don't do that wish cycling thing and toss that into your bin and hope for the best. Um, if you're getting new gadgets, uh, you know, electronic gadgets, uh, you want to get uh, recycle your old gadgets. Uh, you can bring them back. Uh, Best Buy, I know for a fact, uh, will accept three electronic items per day. So if you've got old old phones, um, old gaming consoles, things like that, um, you know, you want it, You don't want to toss that in the trash or or your recycling bin. You want to bring it back to an electronics retailer, or maybe your town has a um, uh, a drop-off facility for that as well. And then finally, rear cardboard, you know, we all know that's recyclable. Um, you, you know, break them down, put them in your bin. I know you've got a drop-off center on, I think it's Hartwell Avenue in Lexington, um, but be sure to remove any plastic film or styrofoam packaging. So if that's mixed in with your cardboard, you know, it's not gonna be recyclable. 
So those are some kind of high level things to keep in mind as we head towards the holidays. All right, I'm gonna shift gears here. We're getting near the end um, about just the other R's, you know, in the, the, the reduce, reuse, recycle. We spent a lot of time on recycling, but reduce isn't something we should all try to focus on. Uh, this gentleman here is just trying to illustrate how much he's wearing the trash that he personally generates on his body over the course of 30 days. Uh, in New York City, you can see he's not too popular there on the subway, but um, you know he's just trying to illustrate that the fact that the average American generates around seven pounds of trash a day. Um, and there are all small things we can all do to just reduce that such as using refillable water bottles and coffee mugs, there you go. Um, reusable utensils and straws, um, lunch containers for young kids instead of you know, a paper bag and Ziploc bags and all aluminum foil, you know, just get reusable containers for all of that. Um, one thing I, I encourage people to do is just have like a to-go bag you know, in your car uh, I've got one, it's got, you know, a mug, it's got a water, a reusable water bottle, it's got a cutlery, a metal straw. Uh, that way, if I'm out and about and I do decide to buy some takeout or whatever, I can just say, you know what, I don't need this. I don't need all that plastic cutlery. I don't need a, a straw, I've got it. Uh, so those are just small changes we can all make to try to make a difference. Uh, reducing food waste, you know, I mentioned that's 26%. Uh, of the waste stream here. Um, so number one, you know, what can we do is just try to waste less food. You know, we'll obviously we'll all save some money by doing that. And then look into composting. So you can have a backyard compost bin, uh, an indoor system or subscribe to a curbside service such as uh, I think black earth composting. I believe that's uh, set up in, uh, in Lexington. Um, and you know, you're uh, in that case, you actually get some compost back that you can use in your gardens. But again, the, the food waste is just a huge, huge area that we can hopefully uh, make some progress on. And then when we talk about reduce, uh, reuse, um, you know, let's not overlook the importance of repairing items. You know, unfortunately, a lot of things today are made for, they call it planned obsolescence. So manufacturers, uh, especially in the electronics area, you know, it used to be, remember TV repairmen, you know, uh, nobody gets a TV repaired anymore, sadly. Uh, something breaks, well, just toss it and get a new one. Uh, so there is a growing movement uh, and Mass DEP is promoting this as well uh, to, to create things called repair cafes where you bring items and, and people with some uh, knowledge and skills in those areas will actually fix things. Um, but other ways, uh, you know, to promote reuse are to sell and donate items. Um, you know, Facebook Marketplace. There are things called buy nothing groups on Facebook. There's probably one for Lexington, so you can say, "Hey, hey, I've got, um, you know, uh, an old TV. I'm going to give it away. Someone's looking for a TV, uh, so we keep those things out of the landfills." Uh, consignment stores, uh, Habitat for Humanity is, is another great place where you can donate. And again, that Beyond the Bin uh, website, as well as another one called donationtown.org, where in some cases, these places will come and take stuff away for you. So that saves you the effort of having to transport it somewhere else. So again, try to, um, we try, if we try to reuse as much as possible, we'll be uh, reducing that overall, overall amount of waste. And lastly, this is kind of like a bonus R I throw in, is just refuse single use plastic. So. Uh, there's a website and an organization called Break Free from Plastic. I recommend you check out. Uh, but you know, let businesses know that you know you prefer eco-friendly options when you go there. Um, you know, the, the, the effort to ban straws has gotten a lot of publicity, um, when you, which is a good thing. But when you think about it, straws are just such a tiny part of the waste stream. But they almost, they got a kind of a unusual amount of, uh, of attention, uh, maybe because it was that of that video I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the turtle with the straw in his nostril. But, um, you know, let businesses know that, you know, you prefer more eco-friendly products. Um, if you're ordering takeout, which a lot of people are doing these days, you know, you, you can say, hey, I don't, you don't need to put the, the plastic utensils in the bag or the napkins or, or the plates you know, I've got all that stuff and I'm going to eat this at home. I've got all those items. So um, 
So those are some easy things that we can all do. All right, last uh, section here is just uh, briefly talk about another type of trash, which is litter. And, you know, litter is basically any item that's not disposed of the right way. It could be something that blows out the back of a pickup truck on the highway. But in most cases, it's, it's done with deliberate intention. In fact, Keep America Beautiful did a study back in 2009 where they actually observed people in public littering to see like, you know, what, what were they doing? And in 85% of the cases, you know, littering was done with what they called notable intent. So uh, often you know, maybe there wasn't a trash barrel nearby, um, but in most cases, you know, people are, people are doing it. People are throwing stuff out their car windows, uh, which is a major challenge uh, that, you know, to change that behavior. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the poll questions I was going to ask, um, you know, was, you know, what is your biggest litter pet peeve? And uh, the choices uh, on that question are things like um, plastic water bottles, cigarettes, dog poop bags that we see in many places, uh, the empty miniature liquor bottles known as nips. Um, and, uh, you know, those are the most kind of common things we see here in Massachusetts as far as uh, roadside litter. Um, and at Keep Massachusetts Beautiful, uh, which I haven't really talked about to this point, we do a program called the Great Massachusetts Cleanup. So we encourage people in communities across the state to organize uh, local cleanups in the spring and the fall. Um, in the spring of 2019, we had 125 communities that participated in this, uh, thousands of volunteers. Uh, unfortunately, spring of 2020, you know, we weren't able to bring large groups together. Uh, however, this fall, we have had a lot of communities that have been able to do socially distanced uh, cleanups. You know, as long as you, you, people are uh, geared up properly and, and not coming together in a huge uh, crowd, um, it's a pretty safe thing to do. So um, if you go to our website, keepmassbeautiful.org slash GMC, Great Mass Cleanup, um, you know, we would encourage uh, folks in Lexington, if you don't already have something organized to organize something for next spring, or if you do have something organized, you know, register it through our website, we will uh, publicize it and hopefully help uh, drive more volunteers to your, to your cleanup. And then a new program uh, we launched uh, this year is um, kind of in response to COVID-19 because we weren't able to, to, to bring large groups together is uh, the mass litter cleanup crew. So this um, we launched it kind of quietly over the summer, but it's actually getting a lot of good response. We've got about 150 people signed up so far. So what this is, is, you know, the idea is, you know, we could all go and clean up our street, our neighborhood, you know, when we're out taking a walk, whether it's with your dog or your family or by yourself. Um, so if you sign up on this uh, website here, you see the link, uh, we will send you free of charge a, a litter cleanup kit that includes a litter grabber tool, a pair of gloves, we just added a face mask to the kit, a reusable bag, um, and an official t-shirt that says proud member. So, you know, we're trying to just get people to mobilize to just, if, uh, People are cleaning up their own neighborhoods on a regular basis. You know that that will keep things uh, litter-free year-round versus those large community cleanups, which happen you know one day. <clears throat> you know it's one day out of the year, but we'd rather have people out there all the time. And I also I just actually published a column. It's in the uh, Wicked Local, um, Mansfield, and Easton, and it may end up in Lexington. But um, on just kind of the mental health benefits of getting out there during this difficult time. Um, to get outside, do something good in your community and make a difference. So um, we encourage people to sign up for this program. I mentioned there's no charge for the litter cleanup kits, although we do ask you know, for donation after people sign up if they're so inclined and able to donate to help offset that cost. Um, all right, so summing up, um, you know, as far as what you know, actions we can all take to kind of as it says here, be the change you wish to see in the world. Um, you know, we can all reduce the amount of trash that we create every day. We can reuse whatever uh, you can or donate it to someone else. Recycle as much, but do it correctly. That's the key thing. You know, this contamination issue is a big, big challenge. 
um, refuse single-use plastic. Let the businesses know, you know, you, you want better options. Teach your family and friends how to recycle correctly, whether uh, you're older and you've got uh, kids or grandkids or vice versa. Sometimes it's the young kids teaching the older people. Um, and then, you know, participate in the Mass Litter Cleanup Crew uh, or the Great Massachusetts Cleanup, or you can even launch a local Keep Massachusetts Beautiful chapter. All right, we're gonna do a, I'm gonna actually skip over this because of time constraints. I'm gonna give you the answers, all right? So what percentage of trash in Massachusetts is sent to waste to energy plants? Um, the answer was uh, roughly 60%. So that's pretty high. Um, how many landfills are currently open in Massachusetts? You may remember uh, that we have uh, six left. And what is that term for the circular currents in the oceans um, that causes the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? That's called a gyre. It's actually a website called fivegyres.org that focuses on that issue. Um, what's something that you can't recycle in the single stream or, or curbside, but you could recycle it somewhere else? Uh, so that's things like uh, well, clothing, um, electronics, uh, things like that. You can bring you can, plastic bags. I, I should have mentioned plastic bags earlier. If you do use a plastic bag, most supermarkets uh, have a bin right near the entrance where you can return them. So rather than tossing those in the trash. Uh, what's the name of the state's online recycling website? There's a clue at the bottom right of your screen. So that's uh, recyclesmartma.org. So if you haven't checked that out, I encourage you to do that. And what's one thing we can all do to reduce what we, you know, that seven pounds of trash we're all generating. You know, we, I mentioned things like, you know, reusable water bottles and coffee cups and cutlery and straws, easy things like that. All right, so Recycle Smart MA, I mentioned, uh, you know, that's the website. They are on Facebook. They post some great educational um, uh, content there. So you can kind of get smarter on these issues all the time, as well as on uh, Twitter and, and Instagram. And then just a few words on Keep Massachusetts Beautiful. This is our mission statement. And the key words here are, you know, taking action. So we're really about getting people out and about in their communities. Um, you know, we realize that we don't wanna just kind of be like the litter cleanup crew for everybody, so to speak. But we also recognize that, you know, you gotta start somewhere. And, and you got, so if we can clean up what's already currently been littered uh, and then focus on how do we change behaviors and get people, you know, educate the public about, you know, the impact of that behavior uh, hopefully over time we will uh, we will bend the curve, so to speak. Uh, I mentioned we have local chapters. Uh, currently, third we're up to thirty chapters. Um, nothing in Lexington. We'd love to see Lexington turn green someday. Um, but uh, if anyone is interested, uh, just contact me uh, directly, and I can. And we've got information on our website about. Um, uh, including a, a webinar we just did recently on kind of the, what's involved in starting a local chapter, the benefits of doing such. Um, so if you go on our website, you will find that as well. And finally, uh, this is where we can find Keep Mass Beautiful, our website. We post a lot on our Facebook page. We also have a Facebook group. Um, so I encourage you to follow us there and, uh, and keep, uh, getting more educated on these issues. And then lastly, uh, this is in the chat, um, this uh, survey, if you can, this URL is in the survey, in the chat box, excuse me. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking a couple minutes, give us your feedback. Like I said, we're always trying to tweak this as we go along and, and try to answer the questions that people have. So, all right, that was a lot of information. I applaud you all for listening that long. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then we'll just open it up to questions. Thank you, Neil, that was amazing. I feel like I learned so much. Um, I'm just gonna go through the questions. There's some comments interspersed. I'll throw those out as well. Um, Steve says about recycling bins that a few stores have separation instructions, but most don't, which is unfortunate. Um, here's a question from Elizabeth. Are caps truly recyclable, even if they don't have the recycled plastic number? 
caps like uh, like a water bottle? The answer is yes. Um, in fact, um, so you, but it has to be attached. That's the that's the key. If it's separate, it's not going to get recycled because the machinery that sorts this uh, all these materials can't pick up tiny items. Um, they, those kind of they fall through the cracks essentially. So if it's attached to the bottle, it will be recycled. Um, one question I had, because uh, Recycle Smart just posted something up to this effect on um, Facebook, I think it was yesterday. Um, and um, and my question to them was, what about you know glass jars with metal lids? Because, and I'm still waiting for the answer. Um, so, because in that case, it's two separate materials. So to me, it would seem like, you know, that shouldn't be combined, but uh, uh, stay tuned on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we will. Um, Diane says, Europe has laws for manufacturers to use recycled plastics in their containers. Are these containers then recyclable? In other words, how many times can you recycle plastic material? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I would say, you know, there are limits um, you know, as to how many times something can get recycled. Um, so, uh, it depends on, on the product, I think. Um. Okay. Um, we've heard that you can put dairy and meat products into your black earth compost bin. Um, so that's good. COVID has latex glove use in schools and workplace pre-wrapped food use exponentially growing. How do we handle medical, medical good practice intentions and plastic reduction? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> you know, I, um, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I would, you know, uh, I, I should mention that uh, sometimes when I do this presentation, I'll have someone from Mass DEP with me uh, to answer some of these tougher questions. Um, but yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, COVID obviously has, has just reversed some of the progress we were making in plastic reduction. Um, you know, the plastics industry kind of was quick to uh, jump on this and, 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 you know, advocate for getting rid of bag bans and things like that. Um, so there's a lot, um, a lot more to do here. And when it comes to medical stuff, you know, the, yeah, I mean, when it comes to safety, that's probably going to overrule, um, you know, the, the, the plastic issue. Right. So, um, Thank you for that. We had some really good comments about your um, the poll for the what was more annoying: dog poop bags, use use face masks are more annoying than uh, annoying than dog poop bags. It's a tough decision, <laughs> and you're seeing more litter is face masks and gloves. Yeah, the PPE litter um, is a big issue. You know, when we do our cleanups, so we're doing one in Attleboro tomorrow. As a matter of fact, you know, obviously we. We find too many masks. Um, it always just puzzles me. I'm like, do people dropping them? Or are they just, they, they, you know, accidentally or on purpose? Um, but one thing I would mention is it just for anyone who isn't aware, you know, that stuff should never go in your recycling bin. Um, it should go in the trash. Um, we're not seeing as many gloves uh, as we were back in the spring because um, at that point, everyone thought, you know, we were. You know, we were running our groceries through the dishwasher before we, <laughs> uh, that's kind of gone away uh, as far as the, the concerns is so much about contact uh, spread. Uh, so we're not seeing as many gloves, so that's a good thing, but still way too many masks. Right. Is it because it has the, um, like possibly a metal thing up in the nose area that they're not recyclable? Yeah, and um, different materials, um, you know, generally speaking, you know, any kind of flimsy material, like like when it comes to paper, like napkins are not recyclable. Um, you know, it gets to a a certain level where it's just it's just too thin to be recycled. I, I don't know the exact reason when it comes to the masks, but uh, I would imagine even just from a health perspective, you know, it's probably you know better to not recycle something like that. Okay. Um, somebody said that there was a picture uh, that had egg cart that said egg cartons were recyclable, but the caption said that put them in the trash bin. 
So which those one? Were, yeah, that was styrofoam. Uh, styrofoam is one of those tricky uh, materials where, uh, you know, it is technically recyclable, but there's no market for it. Uh, there's no commercially viable market here in Massachusetts. There was a company a few years back called Refoamit that was trying to recycle. So it's, um, there is another company that is currently doing, I forget the name, um, but it's, it's a tricky business. And when it comes to the single stream system, it's not recyclable. And, and the companies are a kind of a problem in this area because they'll put that recycling emblem, uh, a major coffee chain, which we're all familiar with, you know, which only recently phased out its styrofoam cups, forever had the recycling emblem on the bottom of those cups, which would lead people to think, oh, I can put this in my recycling bin. But, you know, the fact was it was not being recycled. Um, a lot of towns do have drop off centers for like larger uh, styrofoam. And uh, like if you buy a new TV or something like that, and in some cases that stuff does get recycled, and in some cases does not. Okay. So um, we heard that styrofoam egg cartons are trash. Cardboard, paperboard egg cartons are recyclable, and that Lexington did pass a bylaw about styrofoam food service that went into effect this year. But the question, there's a question about if, if there's legislation to make styrofoam illegal. Oh, you know, there's probably a bill out there somewhere. There are so many bills um, trying to target, you know, different elements of the waste stream. Um, you know, one that's more broad that is focused on this, this idea of uh, extended producer responsibility, EPR, if anyone's familiar with that, which is more prevalent in Europe, uh, where, you know, the idea being that companies should be responsible for the life cycle of whatever it is they're selling. So that, you know, our system in this country is, you know, you buy something and then when you go throw it away, uh, it's up, you know, the taxpayers essentially pick up the bill for disposing of, of all this stuff that we consume. Um, and the, uh, the idea there is, uh, you know, maybe the company should have a bigger role and, and that they should try to design their products better so that they are actually um, more easily recyclable or that they have, you know, less unnecessary plastic and things like that. So that's a, that's a movement that's slowly um, gaining some steam. I know Maine passed the bill like last year or the year before and Massachusetts is debating it, but nothing has materialized yet. Okay. And um, what would be your advice on recycling medications? Yeah, don't toss, toss that in your bin, number one. Uh, most uh, towns uh, will have a drop-off center, typically uh, at the police office, police station, where you can bring your uh, expired or no longer needed uh, prescription drugs. Um, I know I recently did that. Um, or a family member who passed away and you know had had just a you know a huge amount of, of pharmaceuticals that you know my mother was ready to toss this stuff in the trash. I said, no, you don't want to do that. So um, so most places have a drop-off bin for that. Okay. Um, that's what I thought too. Um, what are we doing top down to reduce packaging, including grocery stores and Amazon? Ooh, ah, well, when it comes to grocery stores, I mean they're not the ones creating the packaging, you know, they're just putting it out there. So I don't know that they're doing anything. Um, I don't know that it's, unless they pressure, you know, the, the manufacturers to do something, they, they could certainly help. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it comes down to consumers, you know, like I mentioned earlier on that refuse plastic um, issue. Uh, I know recently I bought some Hellman's mayonnaise and uh, you know, the, the jar says this jar was made with recycled plastic. And you know, that to me, it was like, oh, okay, great. I'm buying this one. Um, so a lot of companies are making these public pledges to um, increase the percentage of, uh, of recycled plastic that they use, you know, cause that helps build this market and this kind of you know, closed loop system so there's some progress happening there, but still a long way to go. Um, and, um, you know, meanwhile, we're building new, you know, the oil industry is, you know, basically looking to the future and, and re, you know, 
oil prices are way down, you know, we're kind of gradually moving away from fossil fuels and they're, they're seeing the, uh, the writing on the, on the wall and they are now focused on using the oil and gas that they um, produce to create more plastic. And there's huge new plants being built in Pennsylvania and other places. Uh, and I showed you that chart earlier, you know, just we're going in the wrong direction. Right. Um, how do we refuse single use plastics, for example, yogurt containers? Even if you buy larger multi-serving containers, it seems like you're also accessing more plastic in those containers. Is there an alternative? <laughs> buy a cow? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know there is, um, you know, there's, there's a store, we have it listed on our website. There's a link, there's a page called Green Links. And there's a, um, there's a guide uh, on there to buying in bulk, a mass, you know, from Massachusetts. So it lists stores that sell items in bulk where you can come in with your own containers and not have to, um, you know, buy all that single use plastic. Um, if that, you know, more places like that were available, that, that would certainly be a good thing. Um, but when it comes to that specific question on the yogurt, yeah, I don't, I guess, you know, one thing you do is yeah buy the bigger items versus separate smaller ones, but that's another intractable problem, I guess you could say. I was going to say that um, in India, where I'm from, we make our own yogurt. It's very very easy. You just need a starter, just like a lot of people are doing sourdough. So that's one option as well. <laughs> All right. Why don't you put that out there? You on the social media, and you'll you'll go viral. <laughs> I should. Yeah. I mean, the whole, you know, sourdough went, went viral. Why wouldn't yogurt? Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it tastes really good, too, by the way. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, people are like, don't flush meds down the toilet. It contaminates the drinking water, of course. Yeah. Um, and there's a medical drop-off bin behind town office building in Lexington. It was closed for a while, but now it's reopened. Um, is it better to buy products in recycled plastic or in glass containers? Ah, uh, that's that's another tough one. You guys are tough. Um, I would say, you know, glass is is um, I guess less of a, a damaging to the environment than plastic. Uh, it's not easily recyclable, however. There was one plant in Massachusetts that was recycling glass that closed about two years ago. Um, as a result, you know, glass is having to be shipped out of state, which is expensive because it's heavy. Um, it's also now being used as, as being mixed in with like asphalt and things like that for, for road uh, resurfacing. So they're trying to come up with some more creative uses for glass. Um, so I don't know the exact answer to that one. You know, there's, there's, like I said earlier, there's trade-offs on all these all these choices. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, comment that the, that Whole Foods has items in bulk, but only certain items. And right. where do would you recycle batteries and bulb lamps? Batteries and what? Batteries and bulb lamp uh, lamps, like light bulbs. All right, on the light bulbs, so we had the, uh, what, the CFL bulbs there for a while, the, the ones that were never a favorite of mine because you turn on the light and it takes like 10 minutes to actually warm up and become bright. Um, and those, you know, we roll those out and they have, you know, you read the box and it's got mercury in it. And it says, if you break this in your house, you know, like evacuate the house. So it's like, why, I don't know why we ever went to something that was that, potentially toxic uh, was a mystery to me, but those are now being phased out. Those sh should not go in your trash or your recycling bin. They should go back to the store. Most uh, local hardware stores will take them. Uh, I believe Home Depot still takes them. Um, and just be careful when you transport them, you don't want to break them. Um, uh, what was the other batteries? Uh, oh, again, yeah. on that on our site, uh, Green Links, there's um, a link for batteries, uh, forget the name of the website called. So forget the, the there's a whole guide to, to what to do with batteries. Your av everyday um, battery, what are they called? Um, escaping me, the, the name of the, the common battery that's in your remote control. 
Those should go in the trash, not the recycling bin. Um, I think they used to have more toxic things in them than they do now. So now they say they can go in the trash. Rechargeable batteries should not go in the trash. Uh, and those can be recycled at um, either a drop-off center or at um, stores, electronic stores. Um, so, so, so check into that, uh, that website, call to recycle, I think it's called, um, on the batteries. Uh, can get a little complex when it comes to batteries. Uh, also the, uh, the button batteries, uh, I believe Lexington collects those as well. Um, those should not go in the trash or the recycling either. Okay. Um, we did hear that Hartwell Ab takes CFLs and that Lexington is rumored to be installing glass recycling bins at Hartwell Ab. Interesting. Good. Um, yeah. Also, Cindy shared a link, some links for the green team in Lexington if people want to click on those or um, you know, find more information about local, you know, thinking locally. Um, and somebody, Francis asked, some towns will pick up compost materials. Why does Lexington not do that? I'm guessing you don't know the answer to that, but we can, fi we can find out. Uh, I would say it's probably cost, you know? So it's always a matter of how much you're willing, you know, hey, yeah, we can do that, but uh, we're gonna raise your property taxes you know, to do it. So that's always the struggle. Um, mm, that's in everything, yeah. Mina, can I ask a question? I, my screen went away. I, I have sound and just some small things and I can't find my chat thing. Um, I got yes, in head. Um, I wanted to know why you think the towns won't um, do a massive uh, waste collection for food, food waste where it's 26% of the waste and they're paying for that, that heavy pickup when they could save money by having it be townwide. Yeah, I can, I can answer that a little bit. We, I'm on a trash and recycling subcommittee here in, in Mansfield where I live. And we just discussed that very topic last night. Um, you know, we're talking about maybe, I mean, there are private services that I mentioned earlier that do it. Um, it it's, a, it's, it's a cost, you know, it, it's labor and, and cost. So you've got to collect it and you've got to bring it somewhere. Um, like an, an anaerobic digester or something like that, which um, those facilities sometimes have strong odors. So like that whole not in my backyard thing, where are you gonna put it? Or if you, if you find another place that will take it, now you're transporting all this heavy material, which is expensive to do. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's like, it's a relatively new issue. Um, that we're finally realizing how much food waste is out there. Um, and I think it's, I think, you know, it's just gonna take time to come up with some better solutions. Uh, so there's no easy answer on that one. If I, if I could speak up, Neil, this is really, really good. My name's Cindy Ahrens. I'm the one that Mina mentioned. I put some um, links to resources that the, I'm part of the Lexington Green Teams has put together. Yep. A, colleague, a colleague of mine is on the line and we're actually on, on a similar, um, a subcommittee or work work task group within the town, yeah. um, and I think you, everything you said is right. And the and the cost about um, composting, Marjorie, you're totally right that this is something we we should be doing. It's sort of like a it's like moving costs around instead of having the paying the cost in the trash, you got to pay the cost in, on the on the compost side. But there's so many other um, benefits to doing that, to diverting your food waste. And I just wanted to mention that any of you that that you know, think that's important for the town to do, you should reach out to, to town government and tell them that this is what you want. So they need to, you know, they need the advocacy from their, from their citizens. So. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I should mention, I'm on the, um, the Mansfield Select Board. I can tell you, you know, trash and recycling is like the third rail of, uh, of local politics. <laughs> you, you know, we're trying to decide on recommending some minor changes or maybe some more drastic changes and, um, you know, people get very upset. People, uh, Americans are very, uh, you know, I just use the word entitled when it comes to their trash. You know, we, we have this uh, kind of philosophy that we should be able to throw away as much as we can and it shouldn't cost us anything. You know, and, and people don't understand how much it does cost. 
especially when the cost is buried, uh, like in, in our town, it's just buried within your property taxes. It's not a, a separate fee. So that's one item we're discussing is, you know, maybe we um, se separate it out and charge a, you know, an annual or quarterly fee or whatever it might be. So the people will know, oh, wow, this, this is what it costs to deal with my trash and recycling. And maybe if I had less of it or managed it better and didn't contaminate my recycling, maybe our costs wouldn't continue to skyrocket. But it's, it's a tough one. So I'm coming back to say thank you, Neil. This has been incredibly informative. Um, I've been getting notes and stuff from people saying that they'd like to bring you to the Boston Public Library and, you know, <laughs> what else can we do? Um, I did want to ask if I, if, uh, I to ask you if we can get a list of your links that were um, that you mentioned during the talk and I can send them out in a recap, but I can talk to you about that more. I just want to let people know that I will be um, looking for that. Um, but thank you again for your time and for um, putting this together. I, you know, especially the holiday part where I was really interested because I know that we're, we, a lot of people are doing even more online shopping this year than ever before. Yeah, one thing I didn't mention, uh, when someone mentioned earlier, Amazon, I believe I've been, I've read this, that you can, on your Amazon account, you can contact them to say, you, you know, I want eco-friendly delivery, you know, don't give me all the plastic, uh, styrofoam peanuts, and don't give me all that extra plastic bubble wrap that I don't need. Um, I don't know how it actually works out, but I've been told you can request that. You can, it's through your account and you just yeah. tell it, there's a thing that says, I want less packaging and right. they should. And you can also bundle your packages together so you get the least amount of deliveries as possible too. Yeah, it's like carbon so emissions, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about this all day because there's I could so talk trash all day long. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I got nothing until noon. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I could also talk trash all day apparently. <laughs> But um, I'm going to let you go. And um, I want to thank everybody for being here. And um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I will share Neil's contact information with you um, and his website um, in the recap. So again, thank you for all, all for being here. Thank you, Neil, for, um, for sh uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Right, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Right, bye, everyone.